Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Active Inference Lab. Today, it is August 9th, 2021, and we're here in guest stream number 8.1 with Mark Miller and guests. So this is going to be an awesome presentation followed by a discussion. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please put them in the live chat, and we'll make sure to ask the panel at the end of the presentation. So thanks again to all of our great guests for coming on and please take it away. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks for that, Daniel. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Oh, can you uh, turn on screen sharing for me on your side? Um, it's under the advanced. So at the bottom where it says share screen, there should be a little, uh, little arrow and click that. There should be an advanced feature and then it should say allow. Got it. Okay, go for yeah, it. Yeah, that's it. Uh-huh. Great. How's that? Can you just see my slide? Does that Looks look right? Good. Excellent. Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, Daniel, thanks. Thanks so much, man, for the invitation to come and give a talk. I mean, we've been trying to get, we've been trying to find an opportunity to speak together for, you know, a couple of months now. Well, since I moved to Japan, so um, I'm excited to be here and I'm excited to be talking uh, about this topic, which we're, um, we're really excited about. It's a new paper that actually Julian Kiverstein, who's here right now, and myself and Eric Reitfeld, um, have a preprint out right now in the, the paper title, title of Predictive Risk of Happiness and Wellbeing. We're also anticipating that um, Inez Hippolito and Laura Senved Smith will be here this evening. Lars has had a slight emergency, so um, he's on the road, but we're hoping he'll be able to call in um, because actually the work that uh, we feature in this paper, it builds on or it's really closely related with the research that Inez and Lars are doing. So the idea was that we're going to be able to get, um, we're going to be able to really talk to them about their individual portion. So hopefully they're on the stream by the time we hit that place. And uh, if it turns out that they're not, that's okay. We can just go through and then we can chat at the end. Um, if you don't know me, uh, my name is Mark Miller. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Hokkaido. Um, in their Center for Human Nature, Artificial Intelligence, and Neuroscience, and I am uh, an active inference researcher. Right, so let's see. Um, right, so I guess probably lots of people who are listening to the stream tonight, and definitely the guests who are here right now, hey, Inez, great, you made it, right on. Um, know that um, recently there's been a huge amount of research coming out that's linking um, using the active inference framework in order to investigate all sorts of psychopathologies, you know, mostly finding a home in computational psychiatry circles. But really, we're, we're seeing active inference accounts come up, you know, relating to depression and addiction and OCD and schizophrenia and dissoci dissociative disorders and, and all sorts. And while there is this sort of active inference boom right now in relationship to computational psychiatry and in particular psychopathology, we're not seeing any work really talking about um, how we might apply active inference frameworks to the theoretical and formal approach of discussing things like well-being. So, you know, all those topics that would naturally fit in something like a positive psychology are still primarily being overlooked. Although, you know, um, in all fairness, we are starting to see it come up at the edges because we're starting to see people talk about the benefits of hallucinogens and um, also the benefits of meditation. So that was part of our motivation in writing this paper was to see if there was anything interesting to say in a positive account. Yeah, not just the negative account, but the positive account. Um, but the other reason why we decided to write this paper was because actually Julian and Eric and I have written a series of papers now on psychopathologies in particular using the active inference framework. So we have papers out now on um, depression and mood disorders and addiction and depersonalization and OCD. And we started to see that there were some shared characteristics between these various psychopathologies, if you look at them through the sort of computational lens of active inference. And seeing those shared characteristics sort of started providing we think clues about, you know, what might be going right when a human is happy, healthy, and well. And um, that's what our paper is about. And that's what this guest stream will be about as well, looking a little bit more at what some of the predictive dynamics might be that are underlying um, 
subjective happiness and overall well-being. And of course, it's a big topic. So we're not trying to exhaust, you know, we're not trying to exhaust the whole of what well-being would be, but rather just taking a sort of first step to see if we can work out some of the some of the points that might be interesting. So since I have these lovely people here tonight with me, um, I've decided to make my presentation relatively short. Um, I hope it won't be any more than sort of 30 minutes all said. And um, I'm going to pitch it at a relatively high level of abstraction because I think there's like a, a number of nice moves I'd like to give to the audience here tonight to sort of provoke research and provoke some ideas. And um, if you're interested more in the nitty gritty, um, we have the paper out in preprint. So you're, you're more than welcome to go and actually check out the paper. And, and of course, if any questions come up, we can talk about that as well. Great. Okay. So, so I think a, a sort of natural place to start thinking about the relationship between active inference and well-being is to think about optimality. Um, in cognitive neuroscience and psychology today, well-being is often spoke of as a form of optimal psychological functioning. Um, but what exactly optimal means is not very well explained usually, or at least it's underdeveloped. And of course, as a free energy principle and active inference framework researcher, when you look at that, you the first thing I thought was, well, there's a natural way to sort of be thinking about optimality um, in terms of the active inference framework, right? Free energy minimization over the long run approximates optimal Bayesian inference, right? That is sort of Bayesian inference is a form of optimal belief updating. So, um, that fact in some way already gives us, um, you know, it gives the free energy principle and the active inference framework, you might think a, a sort of normativity already, you know, predictive systems tend to create or strive towards an optimal fit between their phenotypical self-organization and the sort of statistical regularities that they encounter in their environments. So um, we think that an important part of well-being. Um, from this perspective is going to have something to do with being a good predictor of the sort of hidden causes. So that's both in the environment and inside uh, the agent of the sort of sensory states that we tend to encounter. And of course, that crucially relies on our being able to optimally update our generative model in ways that are life sustaining and flourishing inducing. And I don't think that that's an incredible stretch just as an opening gamut. Um, you know, we know that well-being is closely related with health in various um, various layers of health, you know, mental health and emotional health and physical health. And um, good predictors, they tend to self-organize in ways that allow them to maintain homeostasis across various contexts and over the long term, right? So, um, oh, and, you know, and sort of best of all, um, if we think along these lines, which I think could be fruitful lines to think along, then we uh, have at our disposal, as lots of um, the listeners today already know, this sort of ever-evolving and ever-growing mathematical suite to help us describe what is a good model, what's a good model all about. So that's our starting point. Our starting point was to think, well, maybe well-being could be discussed broadly as a kind of optimal updating yeah, and the goodness, the goodness of the generative model that the agent uses to form beliefs and uh, control their actions in life-sustaining ways over the long term. Okay, so that's a good start. Um, and I think it fits very nicely with what we already know about lots of psychopathologies, in particular that psychopathologies are characterized by suboptimal beliefs and the sorts of behaviors that come from having suboptimal beliefs. Um, depression is a good example. It's just one out of the hat, though, really. I think if you look at any psychopathology, you're going to find some sort of bad belief is at play at some level of the hierarchy. But I think depression is a nice example. You know, recent accounts of depression, and not just from the active inference camp, um, are highlighting the role that rigid beliefs about one's inability to manage the complexities of their life, including especially the social complexities of their life, is playing a major role in depressive symptoms. And um, we've written a paper on this um, pretty recently. And um, in that paper, we, using the active inference framework, we argued that when an agent is met with enough persistent volatility, then they can eventually develop um, a high level prior about their own high, high level prior belief yeah, about their own um, inability to manage volatility. 
And when you get uh, that high level prior installed, something pretty nasty can happen, right? Um, the system, a predictive system, then starts selectively sampling the world to try to confirm that hypothesis. And in fact, it downregulates any sort of counter evidence that goes against that deep prior, that deep pathological prior. So, so that even when the situation changes, you know, if the agent finds themselves in more positively predictable situations, uh, they tend to hold on to that belief in volatility. And that's really the what we think is the pathological moment. So another way of saying that is um, that an agent, at least a depressed agent, yeah, has uh, become overly confident that it is uncertain. It's overly confident about being uncertain. We're not the only people who've said that. Clark and colleagues have written a fantastic paper. Um, definitely check it out if you don't know it. And in that, they come to the same conclusions. Um, they write, uh, in this sense, we might conjecture that major depression occurs when the brain is certain that it will encounter an uncertain environment. Okay. And um, as we all know, you know, due to the central role that prediction plays in sculpting our experience and directing our behaviors, of course, as soon as we have a high level bias like this installed, um, then it has tremendous power to produce exactly the outcomes that would, um, that would confirm those biases. It's one of the problems of being a predictive agent. You know, The predictive system is really good for lots of things, but one of the problems is, is there's this sort of deep self-fulfilling prophecy that can occur. Okay, um, the rigidity of these bad beliefs is especially important here, and it comes up again when we start thinking about what well-being might be. Um, you know, there's mounting evidence that cognitive rigidity, you know, the sort of stickiness of bad beliefs, um, that they're a basic feature of psychopathologies. And in fact, you know, um, some people are even saying that it might be the root cause of all psychopathologies, and um, I don't think we disagree um, there's a nice Aon article about this if you uh, if you're interested in that point, and I think I might just uh, take a take a little break there and hand it over to Inez. Um, Inez Hippolito has a really just a fantastic forthcoming paper coming out that everyone should be excited to be reading, which offers um, a really beautiful, computationally rich account of how insulated internal states, yeah, when these bad beliefs sort of get stuck and then they resist updating, how that creates um, the sorts of pathological belief systems, the pathological behaviors that we see in psychopathology. So um, if it's okay, Inez, I'm just going to stop share and let you maybe talk a little bit about insulated bad beliefs, and then I'll pick it up from here and keep going on to well-being. Yeah, is that okay? Yes, for sure. Great. Um, hi, everyone. Can you hear me and see me? Yeah, okay, great. So first of all, thanks so much for uh, Mark for inviting me to be here. And, and it's always such a pleasure to be here with Daniel uh, for these wonderful sessions. And uh, hi, Julian, uh, very nice to see you as well. So I'll just uh, now share my screen, if I think that's possible, yeah. Let me see. Okay, so for some reason, I'm not able to share my screen. I think it should maybe try again. Okay. No, it doesn't go through for some reason. Uh, Strange, it works for me fine. Yeah. I have no idea. We could okay. go for a uh, an audio thought or you can try to share it later let me just leave and come back if that's okay maybe Sounds that's good you know the trick um this is uh thing. this is this is the new world of technology isn't it you have to do everything on the fly you have to do everything on the fly and be willing to adapt <laughs> i i have one interim question um, yeah please yeah hit it 
were you working on active inference or interested in those approaches and then came to be studying psychopathology or just well-being more broadly or was it the other direction like which way did you no. come at this intersection from yeah you're right and um it started the other way around so um in my master's in which julian was my advisor at the university of edinburgh in 2010 um the last chapter of my senior thesis was a proposal so i was working on empathy looking at um um, you know, philosophy and cognitive science of empathy, looking at dynamic systems, theories of emotion. The last chapter was on predictive processing and active inference. And then I got to do my PhD with Andy Clark, specifically on active inference. And then it grew out of doing that into psychopathology. Yeah, we got it. Very good. <laughs> we got it. Excellent. We got it. Some technical difficulties, but uh, we are now good. Okay. All right. You can see it fine. Yeah. Yep. Nice work. Thanks. And let's continue. Perfect. Okay, so, um, all right, so, um, yeah, so this work is on uh, uh, what we call psychotic Markov blankets, and this is uh, something that I've been working on uh, for the last few months with two different groups applying this to uh, different um, uh, to different things, so one specifically, it's schizophrenia specifically, and the other one is um, uh, disembodiment. So what I thought I would do here today would be to do like sort of like a combination between um, the two so that we get like a bigger picture of what uh, we have in mind with, um, with, uh, with applying this particular framework. So um, yeah, so um, let me just uh, give some like framing about uh, where this comes from and uh, why I'm motivated a little bit. So we always depart from this uh, concept that Mark also just mentioned, the self-organization, which is super relevant to these things that we are talking about when we uh, refer to well-being and mental health and all of that. Um, and as a few words about that, it's uh, an emergence of order from disorder and specifically without any intervention from uh, the external uh, intervention that is external to the system. Um, and then uh, what is important here for us is to think of self-organization as a pattern or an arrangement that gives rise to a specific way in which the system is self-producing and self-distinguishing, and here a nod to the inactivist literature. So, but the idea here, the, the fundamental concept is the self-organizing pattern that, that comes up. Um, this is, why, why are we talking about that? Because we want to look at how the systems or the organisms as a whole are um, interacting with the environment in a way that has been called in embodied literature as attunement with the environment, right? So the idea there is that uh, these organisms or these systems are attuned with their environment and uh, in a way that they will show a certain specific pattern um, or pattern arrangement that will be distinct from, for example, systems that are not attuned to the environment. And this is very well known in um, the whole bulk of literature in disembodiment and phenomenology. So uh, the idea that we want to pursue here is actually relating to a little bit to uh, complex systems theory, in which we want to say that um, this uh, differentiation between embodiment and disembodiment are different patterns. It doesn't mean that the system, that the system um, that is not adjusted to the environment should be considered as disordered, but instead that it has a different kind of order, right? So here we would be sort of like rejecting a little bit the computationalist accounts of um, psychopathology as simply a disorder or, a disorder or an illness and opening up a little bit of more, more like a broad scope or spectrum of, um, to talk about mental health. Um, so then if we set up things like that, then uh, what needs to be explained is how uh, the self-organizing behavior of situated organisms come to be ordered in a certain way rather than another. And then we'll be uh, now talking about uh, mental health. So um, then we think that active inference is um, a very interesting and useful tool precisely to um, think about uh, this uh, self-organization and the patterns that uh, come from self-organization. Um, we think about um, active inference as a model of how uh, living things adjust to the environment, and we all know what active inference is, so I'm just going to highlight what is relevant here for us in terms of pattern dynamics. 
um, we think that um, it is a nice and cool model that um, when associated with tools such as Markov blankets or renormalization group, it can be applied to many different scales of self-organizing activity. And that's where we find all of these patterns uh, of our interest, of our scientific interest. So it is useful to explain um, these gradients, the spectrums of kinds of patterns of order in self-organizing systems. So just highlighting these ideas. Um, so uh, we take it as a model um, in this case. So it means that we are not committing to the, to the realist view of uh, that would say that uh, the phenomenon studied under active inference ontologically possess or leverages the conceptual tool, but that the tool is really important and useful for us to understand uh, certain phenomena. In this case, particularly what we want to understand is uh, disembodiment. Right, so we all know active inference, but again, let me just highlight uh, just some important points to understand then the psychotic Marco blankets later on. So um, here, uh, the idea is that self-organizing, self-producing, self-distinguishing system will correspond to the internal states, which affect and which affects and affect and are affected by the environment and the external states um, um, via a set of other states, such as the active and the sensory states. Active and sensory states are then constructed as influencing one another, giving rise to a certain pattern of self-organization. And this is what's going to be relevant for later on. So in a way, what we want to say is that, well, an adjusted system uh, that self-organizes is a system that um, minimizes the free energy, which we all know can also be understood as uncertainty or entropy and uh, so on, right? But an adjusted system would be something like that a system that is adjust, well adjusted to its environment. And for technicalities, obviously, uh, there are these references on the bottom. Now, moving on to disembodiment, and then later on applying, we want to apply this um, active inference uh, strategy to further highlight or understand what is going on with disembodiment. Um, just a few words about uh, the disembodiment literature. So the idea is that uh, comes from uh, phenomenology and a little bit from existentialist philosophy. And the idea is that uh, the primary experience of the body is the body experience as a subject. And this is really crucial. Um, the thing is that this experience of the body as a subject can be lost. And uh, in which case the body is inspected as an object, more like as a side of scientific interest. And here is what uh, the literature says that that's when this embodiment comes up, is when the body all of a sudden ceases to be experienced as a subject and is now inspected as an object. So what happens is uh, in exploring and interacting with the local environment, we usually, typically, we do not attend to our body. We just like take it for granted. We've got our body that allows us to access, move around, interact, explore the world through our body. And it is not until we cannot do these things or something is wrong, that we will direct our awareness towards the body, and then the body becomes salient as an object of inquiry. And it's right here at this point where we find disembodiment. It's when we cannot um, explore or interact with the world as one would, li would like. So in a way, we can um, distinguish embodiment and disembodiment by saying, uh, for example, or just highlighting these features, of course, the literature is vast, but I think that these are the ones that work for us here. Um, embodiment is an attunement with the environment that is allowed or enabled by having an experience of the body as a subject. Um, and that gets us attuned um, to the environment through a bodily self-awareness or something that there is a bodily self-awareness that is, um, that is uh, uh, felt. And this embodiment, on the, other, on the other hand, is a disattunement with the environment because there is a loss of the body as a subject, body becomes an object, there's a disattunement and a diminished uh, uh, body awareness. So this comes from the literature and it is interesting for us here, why? Because then there's been these links that have been made uh, between psychopathology and psychedelics and disembodiment as in this embodiment being something that is reported in different uh, psychopathology, such as schizophrenia, the personalization, even major depression, or other um, psychopathologies that involve rumination. And 
Another very important thing is that disembodiment also occurs or is, or is reported in the in psychedelics intake. And uh, this has been um, even more relevant to uh, studying disembodiment, precisely in the psychedelic renaissance that we are witnessing today. And also another point that I want to make uh, just here, sort of like in brackets, is just that disembodiment does not necessarily need to be a bad thing, right? We usually put things in uh, good or bad, right or wrong, but it doesn't need to be a bad thing because if we do get uh, some uh, therapeutic effects, um, positive effects from psychedelics is precisely by um, having this um, disembodied experience. So it's just a different way of interacting with the world. And that's why we want to pursue less of a disorder way and much more of a, there's a spectrum of different patterns of interaction with the world, right? Okay, so just that note. Um, then um, I want to look at uh, disembodiment um, and how we can use active inference to understand disembodiment in two uh, ways. One is the, psycho uh, the psychology of disembodiment, so how that disembodiment is felt psychologically, and the other one is the neurobiology of uh, disembodiment. So as we have said, uh, disembodiment is the loss of the body as a subject, which is replaced by uh, some form of intellectual effort. So imagine that you now don't have this broadly access to the world. That is not possible because that's exactly what has been lost by psychopathology or psychedelics intake and many other things, right? So then try to cope and compensate by literally engaging in making inferences about the state of affairs. So here we could use a little bit of the literature and sophisticated active inference, which is this conscious reasoning and planning and policy selection that you engage now with having lost this access to the world through the body. Now, our hypothesis is that the issue is that in this disembodied, because we all engage in sophisticated active inference, that's all fine. Um, the, the difficulty is that in the case of disembodiment um, experience, this inference is, is insulated, is isolated, because what has been lost is the bodily access to the world. So then what happens is, um, so uh, we would have something that looks like this. So we all know this, um, this scheme here, right? And what we want to say is that what is lost now is the... Um, influences between sensory and active states and let me guide you through it so um let's just uh, uh focus on the figure for now so we have internal states as being disembodied reasoning so a subject that has lost this access or bodily access to the world because the body is not felt as a subject so we've got uh, this disembodied reasoning as internal states and then we have external states as the environment where that that, that the subject wants to explore and interact with and then we have a sensory state, the environmental co-constraints, so these aspects that should influence uh, the subject, right? And then as active states, we have the affectivity as um, the ways in which the subject can affect and be, effect and be affected uh, by the environment. But what has been lost here is um, that there is uh, an imbalance between sensory and active states. So for one, active states are not sensitive to sensory states, right? So it is this affectivity or this possibility of being affected by the environment that is not possible. Why? Because the access through the, sub the body as a subject has been lost in this psychopathology or psychedelics uh, as we, that we label as disembodiment experience. So, um, as a coping mechanism, what is going to happen is there will be an increase of activity, of the activity of active states, by increasing the issuing of inferences about the world. So, I do not understand um, what is going on, um, but I'm going to continue to think about it and, make, and, and, and develop theories about what is going on. The problem is that we can we all engage in these developing theories and inferences about what we think is the likelihood of the state of affairs. The situation here in this embodiment is that these inferences are disembodied. So they tend to be false beliefs. 
and that's because of the insulation of internal states. What does this mean? This means that there is not, um, to the access that we had with the world through our lived body is what is lost. So then the subject in a situation where um, the only hope is to increase, in, increase active states um, to make more inferences about the world to cope with that loss. And then the tendency is to have false beliefs. That's when we start entering the realm of psychopathology and psychosis. So in these disembodied cases, uh, this is a, actually a very important point because one could say, okay, so then the problem is, the, is on the level of reasoning. So on the level of, for example, of the internal states as we have set up here. No, the problem is not on the level of the internal states. Reasoning is fine. The inference mechanisms are working perfectly fine. The subject can engage in, um, in reasoning. It can make uh, inferences. The problem is inside the Markov blanket. The problem is in the unbalance that there is between active and sensory states, because those are the ones that are supposed to directly influence one another, such that indirectly there's a connection between internal and external states. But it is this um, direct influence between sensory and active states that um, is problematic. Uh, they are not communicating well, uh, they're not influencing uh, themselves or each other in a balanced way. Um, in, and in a sense, imbalance in the sense that active states become super active and sensory states um, cannot influence active states. So then what we get, we get to this idea of a psychotic Markov blanket, which is if we have this sort of arrangement where there's a problem between the balance of the strength of influences between sensory and active states, then we have um, a problem of the generation of false beliefs. The problem being that these beliefs that are issued by active states, they cannot be updated by the world because it is precisely this access to the world that has been lost, uh, lost by virtue of having lost um, the body as a subject. So then um, because of this, uh, this attunement that we can actually um, explain as what is occurring inside the Markov blanket, um, the reasoning subject makes inference about, inferences about world but um, this reasoning occurs from uh, within a lack of uh, the experience of the body as a subject, so it occurs in an insulated manner. And this is consistent, actually, um, with uh, long-standing literature and phenomenology of psychosis, um, where uh, the subject, and this, there's a bunch of literature on, on psychosis linked to solipsistic behavior, um, solipsistic uh, uh, drawing and painting, and also the philosophical idea, which is the philosophical idea that uh, only one's mind is sure to exist. Uh, and then some, some <laughs> uh, reports that I find quite interesting is uh, uh, some patients would report, I was no longer sure uh, that I was still the same person. I became one uh, with other creatures or objects. I lost the sense of my own boundaries. When I had an experience, I often did not know it was mine or the experience of someone else. So it is quite interesting uh, what can be uh, lost uh, when we lose this um, body as a subject as it is developed in uh, phenomenology. This also happens a little bit in uh, the personalization disorder, um, for example, showing this disembodiment is attunement uh, when uh, making people feel estranged and detached from their self, body and the world. Okay, so this is all I had on the disembodiment, on the psychology of uh, disembodiment. And now I'd like to turn to the neurobiology and also in the end apply the same framework now to the neurobiology of, um, of uh, uh, the underlying neurobiology of disembodiment. So we think that applying the same reasoning is, um, is consistent. So this disattunement that we were talking about felt at uh, agent level should also be expected at the neuro neurological state. So that's our hypothesis, right? So now we think that there are two places, there are two good candidates, uh, proprioception and interoception would be good candidates. Um, so proprioception as a system underlying movement and the location of the body in the environment, as well as interoception as the system responsible for homeostasis. These are good candidates, we think, um, for the neurobiology biology of um, this general disattunement that is felt in disembodiment. Um, so 
proprioceptive and interceptive systems, um, just like any situated organism, can be conceived as self-organizing systems. So we apply exactly the same principle as we would apply uh, to the uh, agent as a self-organizing system. So the question then that we had is, what is the factor uh, that is at the basis of this of a neurobiological pattern underlying proprioception and interception that will show this maladjustment to the local environment? So if we expect the same sort of uh, mechanism or organization or dynamics as to the whole um, agent um, that we were just talking about, then how are we going to find this out as well in the neurobiology? So we think that just like in psychological experience of this embodiment, where the agent becomes insulated from the world, and in this case, we uh, say by virtue of losing the body as a subject, the answer will reside in biological insulation. Um, now, I'm going to focus now on interception because I don't have time to also cover proprioception. Um, and I think that this does give us here some very, very cool insights. So um, I'm going to uh, focus now on uh, the work uh, brought by uh, Barrett and Siemens on interceptive predictions in the brain. And they have a very cool model, which they call embodied predictive interception coding model. And what the goal there is to integrate an anatomical level model of cortical cortical um, connections with Bayesian active inference principles. And they propose a very cool thing, which is that the agranular visceromotor cortices contribute to interception by issuing interception predictions. So more specifically, what they want to say is that the granular limbic regions that regulate visceral motor of the body's um, internal milieu that is the visceral motor cortices. So this is their focus and where they think they uh, will find the interceptive uh, system and where they apply the model. Now, um, so you can see the agranular cortex here uh, on the left. And uh, one very interesting thing that I'm just gonna draw your attention to, and then if you feel uh, that you'd like to uh, read this super interesting paper, then um, please go for it. But I just want to draw your attention to uh, the fact that on the left side, you have the agranular cortex. And there's one thing that is missing from the agranular cortex as um, opposed to uh, the desgranular and the granular cortex. So uh, what is missing is the layer four. And what happens with that is that there won't be, you cannot see uh, there any prediction error neurons. So that's pretty cool because uh, that will uh, give us um, an idea that there is no prediction error neurons in the agranular cortex. Um, so just, I'm just gonna leave that um, out there. And um, just moving uh, forward to just like uh, understanding like the very gist of the embodied predictive uh, interceptive uh, coding model, um, they claim that there is an interceptive system in the brain in which a granular cortices send uh, visceral motor predictions to the body and transmit interceptive predictions about the visceral sensory consequences of those predictions. So uh, they also tell us that a granular visceral motor cortices estimate the balance between the autonomic, metabolic, and immunological resources that are available to the body and the predicted requirements of the body based on past experience, right? So this is going to be very important for us because uh, a chronic imbalance on those things that I was just mentioning can be which can be caused by constantly predicting the need for more metabolic energy to meet the demands of stressors, can produce the well-known depression-related disruption. And it can also eventually down-regulate, uh, do, uh, uh, provoke a down-regulation of hypothalamus uh, or uh, HPA axis negative feedback loops, resulting in chronic hypercortisolemia uh, and in turn can also promote pro-inflammatory state. So this is like some of like the problems of having um, uh, an imbalance on the level of the autonomic, metabolic, and immunological resources, which is what the interoceptive system should be able to do is to give us that uh, nice balance, right? So then applying exactly the same, um, the same framework, the same model that uh, we applied to the whole 
um, body disembodiment or the generalized field of disembodiment that is vastly described in the phenomenology literature, applying this to the neurobiology of the interoceptive system, then what we get is something that can be seen as like quite similar an unbalance between sensory and active state. So let me just uh, guide through the, the figure. So here in this figure, internal states are, inter are or correspond to the interoceptive system and the external states, the environment, whichever um, the multi-scaled uh, system, the interceptive system is part of. And then we have active states as the agranular cortis cortices that send uh, visceral motor predictions. And then we have sensory state, states as the requirements of the body, given the history that the body knows um, to be uh, required for homeostasis. So then in this sense, what we would have is that active states are not sensitive to sensory states. So even though active states can become, uh, in, as a coping mechanism, much more active and send much more um, predictions about what is going on, what's the state of affairs, um, because I'm not receiving any information from the requirements of the body, so the sensory states. So what will happen then, uh, because of this insulation, is that a false belief is going to be generated. So this will correspond to a constantly prediction of the need for more metabolic energy to meet the demands of the stressors. So in this sense, we have here another case of a, what we call a psychotic Markov blanket. Why is it psychotic? Because it delivers, if there is this lack or this imbalance between sensory states or the, of the influences between sensory states and active states, then what we should expect is a, a generation of a false belief. And we can also expect that at a neurobiological level, which is also supported by empirical evidence. So yeah, this is what I wanted to say. Uh, just thanking, um, thanking uh, these uh, collaborators here that have been thinking about and guiding me through as well, these ideas. Thank you, Ness. Really interesting stuff. So I guess we'll return to Mark and then anybody and, uh, is, yep, anyone's free to ask a question in the live chat and I'm writing things down. And then after this second piece of the presentation, we'll have a discussion. So thanks again. Go for it, Mark. Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. Wow, it's so interesting. And I haven't heard some of your stuff about disembodiment yet. And, you know, also this is a research program that I'm extremely interested in. So uh, I'll be picking your brain at the end in the Q&A and, and also after after this event. Um, what, might, what wasn't made obvious in Inez's talk, but I think is implied, is that the stickiness the stickiness of these belief systems and what's helping them become insulated is a story about how precision is being estimated and how precision is being deployed. That's surely one of the mechanisms that is um, creating an imbalance between active and sensory states. Um, so, you know, how precision is estimated is really the agent's ability to assess the uncertainty of its own priors. And when that's working right, then those estimations should result in appropriate model updating. You know, you shouldn't get stuck in an insulated in an insulated situation, but rather you should know, wow, that's not working out the right way. And so appropriate updating should occur. Um, and we know that like maladaptive precision estimation is disastrous, right? And we're seeing it everywhere in the psychopathology literature today. You know, schizophrenic delusion is being um, characterized as too little precision on sensory data, which is putting this heavy emphasis on just top-down predictions. So that's why you're seeing the world in a way that isn't being anchored by what's really happening. And of course, ASD is a little bit the flip, right? Too much precision on prediction errors creates a lot of, a lot of volatility and a little bit difficulty um, establishing good high-level predictions. Um, and as a quick side note, you know, the, the kind of insulated, insulated um, outcomes that create these maladaptive uh, self-organizing styles, they can occur in lots of ways, right? So for instance, yeah, so addictive substances is one good way, right? Addictive substances impact directly precision estimation machinery, right? In the way that the addictive substance um, engages the dopaminergic system. So addictive substances are setting precision outright in a way. So no wonder they can create these sort of suboptimal styles. Um, but societal expectations do the same sort of thing, you know, suboptimally pinning precision on expectations about success, for example, 
you know? Um, so you can have cultural pinning of precision that you should achieve a certain level of success in your life. And, you know, we have deep running relationships between perfectionism and depression, for example. And again, for exactly the same reason that Inez said, overly high precision on some sort of expectation would lead to a constant pervasive background error as you're not hitting that high level of expectation. And then just like um, Feldman Barrett suggests in Simmons, you have an HPA flip because the system just doesn't have unlimited resources. Um, and then the one that I'm most interested in today actually is social media, which is turning out to be a like fantastic way of bending our generative model into all sorts of shapes that cause suboptimal outcomes, right? And that makes sense. It's just giving us wave after wave of um, you know, misinformation through filtered images and staged images. And of course, social media platforms, some social media platforms function just like addictive substances or like casinos in a way. So again, they're um, hijacking the precision system in just the sorts of ways that cause these problems. Okay, I just wanna quickly summarize before I go on to why, what I think the natural mechanisms that keep us out of these problems are. So well-being as optimal model generation importantly depends on correct and flexible, yeah, not these stuck insulated outcomes, but correct and flexible self-estimations of uncertainty. So that's precision assignments. Um, so misassigning precision to prediction errors, which can happen in lots of ways, especially in our, in our modern world, um, will inevitably lead to suboptimal styles of self-organization, suboptimal generative models. And with that, the production of pathological beliefs and pathological behaviors. And um, so that's how it can go wrong, or at least that's the starting point. It's one of the ways that it can go wrong. So that's how it goes wrong. Then what is it that ordinarily keeps us out of these sorts of bad bootstraps, these sorts of insulated uh, disharmonies between the, the system and the environment? And one answer that I like, that we like as a team, it was given by Alex Chance and colleagues, uh, where they said that optimal free energy minimizing agents will benefit from striking a good balance between pragmatic and epistemic engagements. Okay, so that is, they don't only act in a pragmatic way, that is in ways that they're highly confident will reduce free energy over time because they can be wrong. That's part of the take home message from some of the pathological self-organization styles, right? They say that you should also, a good free energy minimizing system is gonna balance that against being driven to epistemically explore and forage for more information about how the world works, but also about how their own model works. And implied there is that when they find important counter evidence while they're out exploring, that they're willing to update their model relative to that counter evidence. So then the question then, if we buy that, and I, I think I do buy that, it's one of the ways that we stay out of these bad bootstraps and out of these suboptimal styles of interacting. Well, how do we find that right balance? I think that's a good question if we're gonna ask, well, how do we live well? What is well being all about? How do we find that good balance? And um, the central way that we've been arguing over a number of papers is that we literally feel our way to that balance. And um, that part, of course, is predicated on everything working right. Because if you have an affective disorder, then it's going to be exactly that mechanism that's going to be mistuned. And of course, we get all the problems um, that Inez just pointed out. So um, in a series of recent papers, we've been exploring the suggestion that um, good precision assignment is going to rely in part on the rate at which error is being reduced. So that's commonly referred to as error dynamics. And um, we're increasingly not alone in this conjecture. Um, we have people like Geoffrey and Corcelli who gave the first paper on this, and of course, Van de Cruz. And then it was beautifully formalized by Casper Hesp and colleagues. Um, so if you want to look really at the nitty gritty of this, that's definitely the paper to check out. And if you wanna see a great paper on the computational bits of this, you should see Casper's talk. It's there on the slide, it's fantastic. So. Um, the idea, um, uh, the idea uh, has developed that these error dynamics, yeah, the changes in the rate at which error is reduced, are registered by the organism as affective states. And um, if we think of an agent's performance in reducing error in terms of a slope, yeah, that plots the various speeds that prediction error is being accommodated relative to our expectations, then we can think that positively and negatively balanced affective states are a reflection of better than or worse than slopes of error reduction. So um, that is just to say, we feel good when we're doing better than expected at reducing error relative to expectations, yeah, better than expected. And we feel bad when we do worse than expected at reducing um, prediction error. And these embodied 
aerodynamics are important drivers of precision estimation, it turns out. And I think that makes sense, of course, right? Because unexpected increases or decreases in volatility relative to your model is important information for how you should set precision on your beliefs about action policies, right? So unexpected decreases in the rate at which error is being reduced tells you that your action policy isn't working the way that you thought it was going to work, which means you should obviously reduce your confidence in that action policy and the other way as well, right? If you're unexpectedly doing better at reducing prediction error relative to some policy, then you should up your confidence in that policy. So the point being here is that precision then isn't adjusted only based on the amount of error um, or the amount of error reduction, but precision is also being tuned um, relative to the rates at which error is being minimized over time. And um, that feature of the active inference framework gives us a rather sexy account of momentary subjective happiness, which I think is so interesting, right? Um, momentary subjective happiness is the result of unexpectedly reducing prediction error. Um, and that feels good because we are suddenly doing better than we thought we would at getting a good predictive grip on our environment, which under normal circumstances would usually mean that we are staying healthy and we're staying well. And um, Joffley and Corcelli's graph makes that clear. You know, as free energy is going up, um, you feel fear and then you feel unhappy when it's super high and then you feel hope when it starts getting better and you feel happy when uh, error is being managed in an extremely good way. But actually it's not only showing up in active inference, these ideas are being presented in, um, in other camps as well. Rob Rutledge is of course the paradigmatic case. Um, he and his team have done a number of uh, brain imaging studies that have already started to show the strong relationship between subjective feelings of happiness and doing better than expected in some particular niche. And you can see on the board behind Rob there, that's the calculation for happiness, which I think is a bit of a, a cheeky way to go, but I think it's cool. Um, and uh, if you know the maths, then of course you're gonna, you're gonna know what's going on there too. Okay, now we get to the fun stuff. This is the last thing. This is sort of, we're coming into the, to the last stretch. Here's the fun stuff. So we think that the same machinery that underlies momentary subjective happiness is also gonna play a leading role in helping us tend towards optimality and to avoid these sort of suboptimal styles of self-organization. So we think it's going to play a special role in an active inference account of what it means to be well. Um, to see why aerodynamics play that role, uh, we just have to ask ourselves, well, where are the best slopes to be found? And the answer is the best slopes are found at the edge of our own predictive capabilities, right? Between what's known and highly reliable and what's unknown and potentially more optimal. And when it's all working right, aerodynamics naturally move us out to that edge, right? Where errors are neither so complex that we can't learn anything from them, nor too easily predictable that there's no more epistemic value. And really the best slope is gonna be right there at the edge of your own capabilities. And you know, that's not a provocative, that's not a provocative idea. We see that everywhere in the curiosity literature. Um, we know that babies are attracted to medium amounts of complexity, not too well known, not too volatile. We see it in mice, put them in a maze with varying rooms of uh, grades of complexity, and the mouse will tend to hang out in the room that's just above its comfortability. And, um, and you know, we're already building um, adaptive and effective robots using these ideas. So this isn't, this isn't a far out idea. So important for our current discussion is that um, in order to make the most of those good slopes that are right at the edge of our own capability, a uh, predictive system must be sometimes willing to disrupt its own fixed point attractors. Yeah, so it must be willing to go beyond its habitual policies, to go beyond its extremely well-known ways of self-organizing, beyond its own homeostatic set points even, right? And that's one of the roles that aerodynamics should play when everything is working right. When it's going well and you're on a good slope of error reduction, then you should be motivated to continue along that path. But when the niche ceases to give you productive prediction errors, then the negative valence that comes up, that signals to the system that it's time to destroy some of these fixed point attractors in favor of more wandering policies, more explorative styles. And I mean, if you want to see that in technical terms, um, just check out uh, Friston, Breakspear, and Deco. That's the paper to go to. So agents that use 
aerodynamics in this way to set precision on action policies, they're going to avoid getting stuck in any one fixed attractor basin for too long, right? They'll instead tend to exist in more metastable states more often. They're going to be poised. They're going to be optimally poised in some way between exploiting already existing off uh, action policies and performing action uh, information seeking epistemic actions that reduce uncertainty. And that metastable poise um, actually grants all sorts of fitness advantages over um, strictly ordered or more chaotic systems, at least in our kind of environment. And that's something that's very well known in the dynamic systems literature. So again, this isn't a, a very provocative claim here. Um, and it's precisely because um, those sorts of systems have an optimal balance between you know, what you might think of as efficiency and degeneracy. Another way of saying that is um, they're set up to respond efficiently um, to particular contexts, those contexts that are highly predictable, but they're also remaining open to exploring and growing and, um, in a wide variety of other possibilities. Okay, so notice then that um, for a free energy minimizing system in our kind of environment, Flourishing is not about avoiding errors. I know that's starting to be more popular, but I think it's a really good point to like hit right on the head. It doesn't flourish by avoiding all errors. It flourishes by selectively sampling the right errors. And I think that's so cool. Like if that wasn't immediately obvious, if you're still not like, you're still not really catching that point, then I think it's, it's a good point to catch soon. Um, uh, what matters for flourishing for a free energy minimizing system in our kind of environment is that it gets the right kinds of errors, gets the right kind of errors into it. And of course, we know that, you know, like outside of the model, it only sounds weird, I think, inside the model, if you're in that camp. Outside of the model, we, all, we, we already know that, you know, overly sterilized environments make children sick. Overly simplified cities make people depressed. Like we know too little volatility um, causes problems for complex self-organizing systems like us. So again, I don't think it's such a provocative claim, although it can sound provocative from inside the active inference framework, maybe. So finding the right sorts of volatility and the suite of cognitive emotional mechanisms that keep us in touch with that good volatility, uh, we think that that's going to play center stage in any account of well-being if we're going to look at it through the active inference lens. And we've done a little bit of work on this already. This is our Aeon article where we do this in a sort of popular way. Um, if you want to check it out, the title of the article is The Value of Uncertainty. Good, okay. Uh, last little bit and then we're done. Oh, so um, in, in the, now we're gonna come into the most speculative part of the idea. And so then we'll stop and then we can, we can talk about it and see where it goes. So in the literature on well-being. Um, researchers tend to congregate in a couple of big camps. Um, and two of the most popular camps are thinking about well-being in terms of feeling good. That's the hedonic camp. And people who think that well-being is about being good. And that's the eudaimoniac camp. And actually, those go all the way back to Aristotle, featured here as the cool guy in the glasses. So we speculate in our paper that actually we might be able to map those two subjective, momentary subjective happiness and overall flourishing being a good sort of predictor on two forms of aerodynamics, um, a local form of aerodynamics and a global form of aerodynamics. And we think that there's a uh, good reason to start thinking about how we might distinguish between local and global aerodynamics. Um, because for instance, think about video game design. Okay. So a well-crafted video game could be highly tailored in such a way that it provides you with just the right evolving changes to keep you continually making learning progress relative to the game. So you're gonna keep finding those good slopes. And we all know, you know, good game design does do that. It keeps creating these good slopes of error reduction. So do good casinos, right? Um, but um, just like with substance addiction, right? You can get so immersed in those local good slopes that um, you end up surfing them at the expense of the other things that matter in your life. So you start neglecting your friendships and your schoolwork and your work um, and your overall fitness, okay? So while you're succeeding locally at the game, uh, you're not flourishing overall because in fact, there's gonna be rising volatility um, across all of these other domains that you're temporarily not paying attention to, right? So sensitivity to 
global aerodynamics would essentially amount to being driven in ways that reflect um, how well we're managing errors across the various domains in our life. And as long as an agent was using those more global um, estimations of how well or poorly they're doing over their various concerns uh, to adjust the precision, then you're going to have an agent who tends to stay in touch and who tends to uh, move towards optimality relative to those multiple cares and concerns. So you're not only improving locally, but we think that there's good reason to think that we're also sensitive to how we're improving overall. And that's going to play a special role in well-being in particular. And um, that makes, if that's right, if we're right here, then that makes a really natural fit between this computational work that we've been interested in and more recent so-called network accounts of well-being, where well-being is thought of as the result of tending to a complex ecosystem of positive states and positive achievements. So then global aerodynamics would be crucial here, we think, to staying in touch with those various concerns in the kinds of way that would allow you as a whole to tend towards a good overall optimal shape. Um, now, like I said, this is the most speculative part of the talk. Nobody has talked yet about thinking about aerodynamics ha happening in a nested way. But I just want to say that we do have good reason to be thinking along that line. It's unfortunate that Lars isn't here with us tonight because it piggybacks on some of his deep parametric modeling. So I was hoping to lay it off on him to really get into the computational nitty gritty of why we're not just pulling this out of a hat for you. Um, but we so we build up this idea that he's already been developing. Um, and the idea is basically, um, he uses a deep parametric model and you can check out his paper on metacognition. Um, if there's a way that we can um, link this somewhere, I can, yeah, we can, okay, I'll, I'll send it to you afterwards. Um, but he ends up showing that, you know, there's higher level policies that are governing the allocation of precision on lower level tasks. And the kind of cool thing about this deep parametric model is that um, it becomes possible to appreciate precisions over those higher level policies over precision allocation to particular tasks. So you get this sort of nested, you get this nested precision estimation where at the lower level, you have precession, precision being adjusted relative to a particular task. And at a higher level, you have precision adjustments that are also effective, we suspect, uh, being set over the policies about how you deploy your precisions over all the things you care about so that that better than or worse than, the global better than or worse than is going to be all about, are you doing better than or worse than at deploying precision across your various cares and concerns, not relative to some local concern. So then we think that what breaks down in addiction in particular is you start paying attention to aerodynamics locally in the drug seeking and taking behaviors, and you actually have a separation of context. And we see that in the brain, right? You see the striatum pull apart from the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So the more contextualizing parts of the brain are no longer communicating in the same sorts of way as they were before because you have ultra high precision on these local aerodynamics. So there again is a good example where we're gonna get an insulated sort of psychotic Markov blanket emerge because of an overestimation of precision because the, the, the drugs of addiction are, are, are um, making that happen. So Lars and myself are currently working on clarifying that aspect of the model. So look forward to work soon on that. Um, and we're looking at how we might apply that model to thinking about um, meditative development, thinking about attending to attention, precision on precision, modeling precision, um, and uh, thinking about how those sorts of mechanisms might help us have better access to and be better guided by these higher level precision tuning processes. Um, yeah. So look forward to that. And uh, maybe that'll be uh, another thing we can come on and uh, talk about here on the lab. And then hopefully Lars will be uh, not in an emergency situation that time and he can come on. Great. Um, so that's probably enough for me. Uh, maybe just as a final note, before we turn it over to Q&A, I might just say um, the future directions for this are plenty if you buy some of the mechanisms that we've been thinking about, right? It would be cool to start now thinking about what sorts of endeavors encourage or disrupt that sort of metastable poise, right? Meditation, hallucinogens, provocative art installations, um, you know, are they, are they helping or hindering? Um, can we foster these metastable states, you know, and, and how? 
And so deep brain stimulation looks like it's doing something like this. You're getting stuck in a tractor basin and OCD, deep brain stimulation. And Julian can talk about that if it was an interesting point. Reopens up the field of affordances by creating more dynamic neural um, ecosystems. Um, what does this mean for how we structure our environment, if this is right? If we flourish by hanging out at the edge of our own capabilities, then what does that mean for how we structure our environment? How should we build our cities? I mean, Abby Taber at, um, at Bath is doing incredible work on this, thinking about how we might structure our cities in ways that are good for us. And actually they turn out to be sort of paradoxically not making the city easier for us, but making it more challenging, getting uh, more diversity, more art installations, more guerrilla gardening, uh, things because actually the more complexity we have, actually the better we are as individuals. And of course, the, the biggest thing I'm working on right now here at uh, Hokkaido University is what does that mean for how we design our technology and how we consume our technology? How about, uh, you know, what role is misinformation as a digital crowbar uh, prying us apart from the statistical realities of our environment? What role is that playing if these flexible, fluid dynamics are part of what it is to be well? That's all. That's all future stuff. And uh, if you're listening to this tonight and you think it's a cool talk and there's something of value here, then uh, that's the way I suggest starting to think next. And I'd love to hear anybody, you know, here on Q and A. But also, um, my door is always open. If you uh, if you sort of dig the talk and you dig the research, then definitely reach out because we're we're always up for collaboration. Okay, that's probably good for me. You're welcome. Awesome. So fun and so many cool ideas in there. Um, anyone in the chat is welcome to provide a question. And first, I'll just pass to Julian to maybe give any remarks or thoughts, and then we'll see if there's any questions in the chat or some questions I've written down. No, I think Mark did a great job, so let's just jump straight into the Q&A. Thanks, Mark. Awesome. Um, okay, so you mentioned it kind of tantalizingly at the end about how we would differentially be using the technology. And that just made me wonder, like, what would inactive inference social media look like? Or how would somebody, of course, not seeing any examples of it out in the wild, how would we even go about imagining that kind of a system? Anybody else want to try to answer first? Because I've got something to say if anything comes up. Should I just should I just go? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. It's something I'm really interested in. Um, maybe one thing to say is uh, you might think that uh, there's a big market for making tech that uh, reduces our option set, um, you know, um, that, oh, well, this tech is great for us because it simplifies our affordance landscape. And that's what people want. They want a sort of simplified affordance landscape. And the danger is, is that actually we're going to be attracted to that because it's going to temporarily reduce free energy faster than we thought it would, right? Google does a great job of uh, quickly minimizing our uncertainty about various topics. But over time, uh, you can have a sort of nasty outcome. And I think we're starting to see that more and more where you collapse because it's so rewarding to come to one place like you know, your smartphone ends up being one place to come again and again and again. And over time, your affordance landscape is collapsing. It's increasingly collapsing to one and only one end. It's a little bit like Walmart, you know, it, you know, you want to buy there because you can get great deals. But the problem is, is that when the whole community buys there and all the mom and shop complexities go out of business, uh, then you're stuck just with Walmart and then they put up their prices. It's a little bit, you know, it's sort of like that. You think that uh, the collapsing uh, tech is going to be good for us, but actually over time, having less complexity is harmful for us. And think about social media platforms as well. Like you sterilize social interaction and it's really rewarding at first because social interaction is hard. It's a complex affair. You know, it's very uncertain how to manage it to be with another human. So temporarily online interactions can be really, really rewarding because they're so much simplified. But if you hang out there for too long and you lose some of your ability to engage with complex human affairs, um, then we're starting to see some of the ramifications of that sort of technology. I mean, we're literally dying of loneliness, even though we're more superficially connected than we've ever been. And I think that would be an interesting project is to start thinking about what is working when we have complex ecosystems of social interactions that we're losing 
by just using social media platforms for our social interaction. Yeah, Julian. Yeah, so I was thinking about uh, intellectual humility as this is something we've been talking about before and how important it is to you know, be open to prediction errors if you're going to get the most out of social media. So you can think of filter bubbles as a kind of psychotic Markov blanket in a way in that there is insulation from any evidence that doesn't match with your your predictions or match with your expectations. Um, so in order to flourish, to, to live well with social media, perhaps what's necessary is, is this kind of openness to uh, other contradictory points of view, um, uh, what the ancients would have thought of as humility. You know, we need to foster that to, to be well with technologies. So, Ines, what do you think about filter bubbles as an example of a, a psychotic Markov blanket? Do you think that's a stretch, or does it fit with your the way that you describe this this insulation from sensory evidence that happens that can induce a kind of solipsism, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's uh, exactly on the right track. Um, actually, uh, the way that uh, algorithms are constructed to deliver precisely these bubbles in social media. <laughs> it's so interesting because it's precisely what's going to happen, a psychotic Markov blanket, because it's just going to be insulated from that amount of information, making inferences about that um, that precise the precise information without having any other uh, contact or exchange outside of the bubble. So that, um, that's very interesting as well. And there are many, many other forms of psychotic Markov blankets that you can find in um, societies and communities and um, that kind of thing. Um, but I did yeah, want to address... Yeah, that's one of the exciting things about the concept that it's scale-free. So yeah. uh, you see it at collective levels of self-organization, not just... But also at the level of the cell you show. So the NMDA receptor you can also think of in terms of uh, a yeah. psychotic yeah, yeah, yeah. model. I did Yes, I didn't have time to present that here uh, because, uh, yeah, but um, but that's that's also formulated under the disconnection hypothesis uh, by Carl. So it's also really cool because it's at a cellular level, so it's quite interesting if anyone is interested. So that will be also um, what we are um, applying or looking at in the in this paper as another example of a psychotic Markov blanket where there's a uh, an imbalance between. Um, again, what I was saying, the sensory and the active states formulated there um, as the, the receptor, so, and specifically for schizophrenia. But then you can scale all of this up and find all of these psychotic Markov blankets um, in many different levels. And I think that in the case of uh, social media, the bubbles are uh, an excellent example. Um, but I think that we also have that, as Mark was mentioning, and I always, uh, I always uh, find it's very interesting uh, when we discuss this topic about um, about how um, uh, specifically um, the city living uh, as a, an environmental um, uh, daily living space uh, influence uh, mental health and um, and um, and specifically um, why and when some groups of individuals thrive in an urban setting. So this is something that some people here in Amsterdam, for example, are working on, and it's really interesting. Um, and I think that it becomes even more interesting if we come, for example, from um, studies in neurodiversity, for example, in autism and that kind of thing. And if we think about the design of these spaces, um, daily spaces, daily living spaces that um, are not designed, for example, for diverse ways of interacting, with the world, such as an autistic uh, interacting with the world. So I think that um, it is very relevant to think about um, uh, these uh, uh, mental problems and how we can inform interventions in the city planning and also uh, smart environments um, that would allow a more diverse way of interacting with the environment as opposed to reducing the complexity of the environment, which is exactly what uh, Mark was talking about. And I just wanted to add that um, to that. Yeah, we're actually working with um, a pretty cool group through the Nested Minds Network 
um, developing models of anti-fragility and what we're calling tropophilia, which is the love of uncertainty. So you're not just growing from volatility, but you're actually seeking volatility in order to grow. And we're thinking about it at the level of communities. So um, we're still just getting started, but um, it's a really fascinating, really fascinating field. Yeah. So one comment on that, and then a question from the chat. Um, Julian, you pointed out that active inference as a scale free and sort of uh, base system agnostic framework really helps draw out these similarities across systems. And then Mark, in the in the presentation, you talked about neural ecosystems, about social, social media ecosystems, and then thinking about some of these pathologies or perceived pathologies in an ecosystem case. I mean, imagine if someone said, I like this tree, this should be the only tree. Or I'm seeing a little tension here with a predator and the prey, we should separate those two species. Those would lead to a catastrophic collapse because it wouldn't be the frag, uh, the it wouldn't be the anti-fragile ecosystem that was the one that had made it all the way to the present moment and was existing far from equilibrium. So it's sort of like when we can look across systems, it gives us a new way to look at the systems that we can modify the niche of, like our cities, the internet, and then starts hopefully shining some light on where we can look. Here's the question from the chat. Um, Dean wrote for Mark, a simple provisioning rule. When in doubt, zoom in, comma, zoom out. So that's Dean's pr providing that as sort of like a little simple uh, motto as an attending <laughs> strategy. Could this be a happy person setting up a local or global non-isolating Markov blanket? Like how do we go from these mathematical framings and some of these aerodynamics into nice slogans like Dean does? <laughs> no, I love that. I mean, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, look look close and look far. I mean, that's that sounds like, that sounds like super good advice. Um, a uh, little bit, you know, this a little bit follows on from the same point Julian was making earlier about virtue, about some of the, like, what would the virtues be uh, relative to this kind of good updating system? And um, I've been meaning to do, a, I've been meaning to write something on this for a long time now. And, you know, I'm, I'm getting more and more motivated as we go along. But have you ever heard of Super Forecasters? Have you heard of this? It's a book out called Super Forecasters. Yeah. So there's people around the world who go to competitions and they predict things from noisy data sets and you can train in it and you get in a team, you can do individual events and people can get better. So you can train to be a super forecaster. So you take noisy data and you get good at predicting it. And I like this idea because I think it's a nice metaphor. You know, I think we might be able to glean, like if we're all predictors and we're trying to predict well, then maybe there's something to learn from people who try to predict well as a hobby, you know, and try to see like, what are they doing right? Um, and there's some really interesting things that they do uh, that I think are um, useful given the kind of framework that we're proposing here. A couple of them, I think just everybody should know about. One, a super forecaster across the board, the best, the best super forecasters in the world, they share a couple of common traits. They are curious. So they're always interested not just in their own field, but they're interested in lots of field. They tend to be polymaths. So they're interested in lots of different sorts of things. That's one thing. The second thing, and this is a little bit, I, I feel like is related to this zoom in, zoom out point. And also exactly what Julian said is that they, ha they, have, they hold, so this active inference language, but they hold high level beliefs that all of their beliefs are only relatively right. So um, they know that when they're looking at something, not to get too enamored by it because it's up for updating at any time. So they're always checking it against the other things they know. They're the kind of person that when you meet them in public and you tell them something they don't know, they don't lock down and say, no, 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 it can't be like that. No, no, no. You know, they're the kind of person who says, wow, wow, I didn't know that. Tell me more about that so I can update, I can update my overall model relative to how the world is. Anyway, I think I think these like. This, this approach to zooming in and zooming out sounds just right. And I think it's so cool to start thinking about what, some, what are some of the practical virtues that would help us not get stuck. And I think, uh, yeah, well, facility is one a quick follow up on that. So yeah. I think what you just described of the super forecasters is, is something that goes back to the ancients again, the Peronian skeptics who put forward the idea that well, we, shouldn't, did, we shouldn't endorse a a proposition but nor should we withhold our endorsement we should rather try to find this balance um what you're describing with the super forecasters with that kind of I hyper drive i think is exactly that same kind of um uh, balance that well that's missing. the paper peroni and skepticism <laughs> through the lens of active inference that's the, yes. that's the paper <laughs> love it 
yeah i in the in the ancient realm it, it made me think about skepticism and like almost like a bayesian stoicism like okay the info has come in through the channel it came in from i would like to learn more i will marginally update like that sort of approach and then also another dialectic that you brought up that it'd be interesting to hear a little more about is that hedonic short-term happiness versus that um the the eudaimonia the longer term happiness just like that's super fascinating to see how you mapped a like a, two pillars of philosophy really going so far back and integrate them in in a new way like where do we go from there how do we think about these kinds of cool syntheses between philosophy and computational dynamics i love that julian do you want to say anything on that if not i could maybe start and you could follow on what do you think yeah so uh the way we were thinking about it was you know, to take i don't know if mark did this example in the talk because i had to pop out but the computer game example did you go through that mark yes exactly Where, you know you might you might find a a computer game that gives you just the right amount of challenges to keep you constantly making progress in playing the game but still in the rest of the person's life they're, they're going to school uh, having your friendships grow, uh, your family life, all of these things could be suffering. Uh, so they're just finding local pleasure, which we can assume the computer game might continually give the person by presenting them with this constant challenge. In the end, wouldn't be conducive to flourishing for that person because all of the other aspects of their life that are also valuable and important to them would end up being neglected. So thinking about that from a, a, a dynamical or a computational perspective, it seems what's important is a kind of psychological flexibility or openness and um, that uh, you're able to be poised between exploiting and exploring. So the, the person that's playing the computer game is really just stuck in a kind of exploitative mode where uh, that's continually um, yielding something rewarding for them because they're continually presented with challenges that they can solve but at the same time they're not exploring they're not curious and so there's not that kind of psychological flexibility which we think is required for eudaimonia for you know, really living a good life and flourishing as a person and uh, so we think what you get out of active inference then is is a a uh, neurocomputational framework, so a biological story, but also a computational story about uh, what it might be to, to, as a person, live a good life. What might be required is this kind of openness and flexibility. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Two other quick things on the tail of that. One is, you know, there's a very old debate about higher and lower hedonia. Yeah. The low hedonia is the sort of animal life that causes all the problems. Higher hedonia, but there is higher hedonia that leads you to whatever the good life is. That's kind of interesting from this perspective as well, because you can think about it, I think, maybe, as lower hedonia is aerodynamics in niches that lead you away from this sort of metastable attunement, right? So drugs of addiction is a good example of lower hedonia because it's good prediction error slopes, but they're only local at the expense of your more integrated, holistic optimality of governing um, state, right? But what would a higher hedonia be? Well, it would be a local good slope that leads you to a greater integration. So at the tail end of our paper, and I didn't mention it here because it's a bit of a further topic, but we suggested maybe thinking about zero sum and non-zero sum activities and their role in producing or restricting these sorts of metastable attunements. And I think that's a good example where you can get you can get hot about some small thing that reduces your dynamicism. So you get this global rising in air, even though you're locally succeeding. That's a nice, I think it's a nice way to think about lower hedonia. Higher hedonia is local good slopes that encourage and expand and, and generate a, a richer and more complex uh, ecosystem of good slopes in your life. So for instance, like well, like think about the things that are endlessly rewarding, you know, love, relationships, you know, like you're, you're never going to get to the end of being a good husband or wife. You're never going to get to the end of being a good older brother or being a good dad 
good mom. You're never going to get to the end of those. That's, that's an endless thing or patience, patience, compassion, love, you know, sympathy, empathy. I mean, you're never going to get to the end of those things. Service, service to the people into your community. Like service is such a good example here. If you feel good, like if you get good slopes in serving your community, you're just going to keep creating more connections that are going to create more opportunities for new kinds of slopes to be caught and encouraged. So I think it's, it's perfect almost, you know, it's a local slope that leads to lots more other slopes. And just one other quick thing, and I won't, I won't, I won't harp on about it, but, uh, and I think also that uh, a system that's set up to be, uh, to have this more global aerodynamic regime working correctly, I think they'll also tend to have more subjective happiness. And it would be good to like go through this and build a, a, a detailed computational model because uh, this part is just a little bit speculative. But it seems to me that if you have a really rich, diverse ecosystem of good slopes, then if you reach the end of some particular slope, like let's say you lose the video game. If the video game is the only thing you have, no wonder we have a problem regulating our emotions if you know, you see this on YouTube all the time, you know, mom or dad turns off the system and there's an explosion and they say, sort of, this is the only thing I have, right? So you're very, very rigid. You're very fragile with only one outcome. But if you have lots of stuff going on in your life, then if you lose a good slope here, it's just a matter of task switching over to the next good slope. And so I tend to think that people who have a diversity of good slopes in their life, of course, they're also going to have uh, more persistent, more pervasive good feelings. But, you know, that's a bit speculative, so we'll have to look. This local, global, nested slopes descent, I think it really helps us understand active inference, but also understands or helps us understand how to apply active inference because it doesn't have to be an active inference model about emotion, but that's the one we're talking about, but it could be some other kind of active inference model. So kind of just two other um, concordances, I guess. Uh, Suzette Mahali's flow and flow psychology. It's like you mentioned selecting the right kind of errors. And so it's like, there's there's being in the flow state of playing chess or of doing a skill. And then there's like getting the rock out of your shoe. It's like, you're, you're still in this sort of uh, uncertainty regime, but one of those is just delaying you on the journey. And the other one kind of is the journey. So that, yeah. and then one other- It's, it's, it's oh, dead ahead. on, it's dead on. Actually, John Verveke at the University of Toronto and I are planning a paper using this exact model to think about flow as cascading, cascading insight. So every time you reduce, you hit that good slope and then you learn, that's what the good slope is, you're learning. And when you get to the end of that learning, what it does is it opens up a new good slope that you learn down, which opens up a new good slope, which you learn down. And that happens in a sort of cascading, a cascading pattern. Yeah, I love that. So that, that perfectly comes to the second example of the cascading insight. Like, so many people, whether they're in academia or just curious about something, when they get a quote answer, they say, well, you know, it just brought up so many more questions. Like now I know how much this planet is in diameter, but now I'm curious about something else. And so it's yeah. like that, that short-term minimization is like disciplinary research. Like we had 25% efficiency on this chemistry extraction. We got to 27. It's a local, like who can, who can say that's not a local improvement, but then that global is the transdisciplinary understanding. And as the research ecosystem, if we just dove down local disciplinary rabbit holes, we would end up with just a wreck. But at the same time, we do need to do some local gradient descent. Otherwise, we're not extracting that compound. So what can we build our transdisciplinary theory on? And so it's just like that. very cool how we can um, have a positive, um, I don't know, can it be neutral and positive at the same time? <laughs> yeah, yeah, why not? Yeah, it, it's positive in the sense that it's not negative. Uh, I, but I, I love that. And I think that's a, I think it's a role that philosophers are increasingly um, playing, you know, what you might call synthetic philosophers, um, philosophers who are trained in various scientific disciplines, the neighboring scientific disciplines around a certain topic, like Dan Dennett, you know, who are able to zoom out and create good overall frameworks that sort of, uh, that, that bring together various disciplines, as well as the special sciences that zoom in, that zoom in and, uh, discover locally. I come in on this. Please, I think one yeah. of the interesting thing is the three of us here are all philosophers. So you know, we all come at active inference through philosophy, but through trying to do that synthetic kind of philosophy where we're, we're integrating philosophy with neuroscience, with biology, 
Um, so that's a common theme. And uh, another thing that I think is interesting among the three of us is that we're all thinking about active inference as something that uh, is environment involving. So one of the crucial, interesting things I think in Innes's work on the psychotic Markov blankets is what happens when you're your, you have a, a free energy minimizing system that's insulated or isolated from uh, what's coming in from the environment and how that can induce pathologies. And a lot of the things we've been talking about today are about kind of designing an ecosystem where being in that kind of environment would help you to flourish as an individual. So what would the, how would you need social media to look if it was instead of creating the kind of social pathologies that we're seeing today with the misinformation problems and all of the problems that are arising from polarization you had a, a social media environment in which people flourished and so we think that you know, these ideas about active inference if you have a philosophical perspective on them you can see how they they could help you to you know, to think about ethical questions, maybe political questions as well. You know, so that synthetic perspective that philosophy can bring helps you to see how to, to take this framework and, and show how it can be applied in lots of different domains. I think that was something that you touched on, Daniel, in one of your observations, questions. Awesome. Um, and that, that, I think, is a, a valuable contribution that philosophers can make from from using these ideas. Totally. We see advances in philosophy alongside and deeply interwoven with governance and technology. So here's just one last question I wanted to ask on that theme, unless anyone has any other questions. And this is um, to Ines's section. So you talked about thinking about and using active inference as a model, which was invoking this realism, instrumentalism, distinction that we had talked about in some other streams. And I just wondered how will realism versus instrumentalism or potentially other philosophical ideas play out clinically? Like what will it look like to deploy something instrumentally and say that, for example, this is being supported by a mathematical framework, but that's not what is per se happening inside of you. It's just how we're instrumentally interacting with it. I don't know. Just how will that kind of a philosophical nuance enter into the regular protocols of medicine or governance? Um, yeah. Um, so I think that um, instrumentalism is very much aligned with dynamical systems theory take on uh, cognition or on brain activity, right? So it doesn't need to be something that... Um, is highly mystical or that is like a framework that we use, but then what can we do with it really like in, in, in medicine or in more experimental settings, right? It's just that it's not um, committed to uh, the more computationalist um, accounts of cognition or of the brain. It's much more aligned with, for example, in this framework with a dynamical systems theory, as in the case of being a tool that is useful to uh, explain and describe um, uh, an activity of scientific interest um, through some constructs that we know are constructs that are we build for our own uh, scientific practice and understanding, right? So that's the idea. So um, it is useful in the sense that you can you can now put things together and make this activity that would otherwise be a blur intelligible in a scientific sense by using these constructs which you can think about it, for example, from dynamical systems theory. Um, Mark was mentioning these attractors, for example, which, by the way, um, I'd like to say something about that. Um, um, in the case of, um, for example, in psychopathology, there is this kind of like fixed points or attractors that kind of like we need to change, etc. We are not saying that there is actually a fixed point or an attractor in the psychopathology, but we are explaining with this in this sense for our own or to make these patterns intelligible from a scientific point of view, right? So it's in this sense that you can use this instrumentalist account to say that you gain explanatory traction, but you're not saying that actually there is a fixed point in the behavior itself. 
Does cool. this help? Yeah, I think so. I mean, if someone looks at an economic model and it uses a regression, it's not saying the economy is a regression, but then there's something about the, the, the personal nature of the brain and our emotions where it feels almost like a model of emotion or emotional dynamics. It's something that's been brought up many times. I mean, a lot of people like qualitative perspectives on these topics because it it uh, averts this whole discussion on whether the mathematical models are real or instrumental. And it almost feels like now with that philosophical clarity to be able to frame the two different modes we have there, we can distinguish very clearly instrumentalism from a sort of background of implicit realism. And then that would maybe help speak to a broader set of people who have different beliefs and different uh, structures for what they think is the underlying system. Can I comment on this briefly? Yes. Yeah, please. Yeah, so I, I think I take a different perspective from Innes on the realism instrumentalism issue. So I, I start from the, the cybernetic idea of the good regulator theorem that Ashby put forward. Um, and I think that gives us a way of thinking about how values are actually built into uh, to living systems and to the idea of being a model of the environment. So not just having a model, but actually being a model and how you can be a good model. So what does it take to be a good model? Well, there has to be as much complexity in the model as there is in the environment that you're interacting with. So I think what we get out of uh, um, out of Ashby's good regulator theorem is, is an idea about what it is to be well adapted to the environment. And um, I don't take that just to be like a model of uh, of life or of systems that are well adapted, but that we can actually get some principles that tell us, well, how would a system need to be organized in order to be well adapted? Um, and those principles, yeah, I mean, they are a model, I agree, but they, they actually tell us something about uh, the organization that a complex adaptive system would need to have if it was to remain well adapted over time, so if it was to be a good model. Um, and then we can get some kind of value or normativity out of that, because notice that there's a notion of goodness implied here that we're thinking about, what would it take for a model to be a good model of this environment, for it to remain well adapted when there's a kind of value or normativity implied there as well. So I think all of that is not just there uh, about you know, finding explanatory models that do a good job for us as scientists, but it's also telling us something about what it is to to be alive, what it is to to be a good cognizer, so that we could begin to get some kind of values out of biology. Um, and I take that to be a, a kind of realist project. Um, because uh, you know, I think that you know, we can we can get some notion of value out of free energy minimization. In fact, I think you know, the notion of free energy is itself a kind of value for a system. It tells a, a system what it is to you know, to be well adapted. It's well adapted if it if it is first of all minimizing free energy over time, but we saw from Mark's talk and from our paper that that on its own isn't sufficient. You need, in addition, this kind of maintaining mess stable poise. Uh, so, you know, all of that is just to say, well, I think we can get some, um, some, something more than just a model out of free energy, free energy principle. We can get some principles which help us to make sense of how there could be values in a, in a world of facts. And so it helps us with that question. It may help us to understand, you know, what it is to, to live a good life. So uh, how could you have natural systems that flourish? So we could get some kind of um, naturalistic account of, uh, of ethical values. So that would be my take on it, and I think that's kind of different from, from instrumentalism, a different kind of perspective on instrumentalism. But I think you can also get out of the free energy principles. There's, you know, there's a debate here, isn't there, 
And that's one of the things that philosophy can bring in. There's different perspectives you can have on what the free energy principle means. And then we can fight about that amongst ourselves as philosophers. Great closing point. We respect and value the, uh, the content, but then also there's that hyper philosophical prior that the space for the debate and the space for different perspectives mm -hmm. is itself important. So with that, yes. thanks to all of you. This was an awesome session. You're always, as well as anyone else, welcome to come back, share any other exciting research or questions. So great times. And I hope everyone watching live and in replay appreciated this great session. So thanks again, everyone. And see you next time. Thank you for having us. Thanks so much, Daniel. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks so much.